Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, first of all, I just wanted to introduce um, our wonderful host uh, with the most. Um, it's Tobin Dommer tonight. He's actually the fintech guy at Shepherd Mullen, based in Palo Alto, right? Yeah, yeah, I come up here as often as I can. Thanks, everybody. I'm a corporate partner at Shepherd Mullen. Uh, happy to have this great panel. Um, one of my favorite topics is sort of the interplay between fintech companies and venture and the new funding model, so I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Tobin. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Mark, and Mark is our moderator for the evening, and he's going to introduce the panellists, and we've got some brilliant panellists, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Pamela, and uh, we do have a great panel tonight. It's a very timely subject, as uh, uh, we've all been reading and as I've been writing about for both uh, SiliconANGLE and the Cube, which is our TV channel. Let's go ahead and uh, get things going right away here and have each of you just uh, take a minute to... Uh, just briefly introduce yourself and um, describe your involvement in this crazy business known as fintech and blockchain and the token economy. So, Kendrick, go ahead. Greeting. Hi, I'm David Blumberg from Blumberg Capital I'm here down the road in San Francisco. We're also in New York and Tel Aviv and invested in companies in about five different countries, US, Israel, Germany, Canada, UK so far. Um, the world, in other words, the world is open and I know a lot of crypto and blockchain folks are in non-US places. That doesn't bother us. We're very open-minded about that. Uh, traditionally, we've been an enterprise investment uh, firm, mostly IT. We've done a lot in fintech, like 26, 27 companies in fintech right now. Managing about 550 million, I believe, in total assets under management. About 55 companies in our portfolios right now across different funds. Um, I think we'd like to say that we add value and like to lead deals and go on boards. Um, crypto, so it's changed some of those. We'll talk about that uh, upcoming. Um, seed and A round is where we like to go in. A few hundred thousand to five million would be our typical uh, traditional investment size. We like to syndicate with great folks <coughs> along here. And we're always looking for wonderful investors because definitely believe that you drive the Ferrari, we're the pit crew, you got to change the oil, fill the gas, and help you get further to the finish line. I thought it was Lambos. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Miko. Uh, I invest with a firm called Gumi, which is a specialist strategic investor based in Japan. So it's really all about early stage uh, cryptocurrency investment, both equity and token side. Uh, we really want to align with founders, uh, and ultimately we want to introduce them into the Japan market, which is both an extremely, exceedingly large cryptocurrency market, possibly met by some measures largest in the world, uh, as well as an extremely difficult market. So you know, we just want to help. So that's our role in the industry. I have a couple of other hats. I do have an advisory uh, service for token sellers, uh, as well as I'm a founder of an exchange called Evercoin. So uh, I think those are those are all the hats, and uh, you know, basically uh, that's me. Here. Hi, uh, I'll make this short. Uh, I think uh, Pimo has broadcast this event to about as many people as I imagine on Twitter every day, five times a day. So if you didn't catch our backgrounds there, sorry to hear that. Um, I'm uh, an operator. I'm working with a company called Tyrion, running business development, but I'm also an advisor to a number of uh, uh, small funds as well as, um, as a couple of startups in the space um, and have been uh, active in the space since about 2013. Hi everyone, Ken Nguyen. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, Pimo, for having us. Uh, I'm, uh, I run an investment platform named Republic. It's republic.co.co, not .com. And we basically are a token sale platform whereby projects can conduct token sale, token pre-sale, and airdrops in a compliant manner, given that all of these things are securities offering after all. Uh, on the other side, we also do launch campaign for traditional tech uh, to fundraise from their supporters in addition to venture <coughs> financing. Republic itself has a pretty interesting financing background. We are the only company seeded by AngelList, uh, the parent company. Uh, we fundraised from VCs a seed round, and a month ago we did a token <coughs> sale backed by Binance Labs and Passport Capital to launch our own securities token. Uh, on the other side, we do have an advisory platform that are looking to structure tokenization of hard assets. Uh, obviously, the issuing tokens would all be securities. So uh, from different perspectives, really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Hi, I'm Ben Narison. I'm a venture partner at NEA. And if you don't know, New Enterprise Associates is one of the largest 
venture firms in the world. It's a very classic venture firm we're now in our 40th year. Uh, I've been there for about a year. Before that, I was a seed investor for eight years, a general partner in another fund for two, and an entrepreneur for 25 years before that. Relative to this category and topic, I think one people ask me because I'm more focused on the reality of traditional venture, which has been something I've either been doing or been observing or been participating in as a feeder for the last 12 years. Um, but yeah, I've been doing FinTech since 2007, Lending Club, Cabbage, Circle Up, Really, Mobile, Ernest, a lot of other companies. And about six years ago, I got introduced to Bitcoin through one of those companies and um, thought at the time it was pretty much a speculative game and decided that I, as an investor, didn't want to be a speculator, which is still right that I ended up today. All right, great. Well, good job. And um, let's dive right into it. And I want to start first with uh, the V word, volatility. Uh, since we're talking about security tokens, as we all know, uh, this has been an interesting month in terms of the roller coaster of uh, token value. In fact, um, uh, one of the stories that I filed last week talked about how uh, the, uh, the token uh, market lost $43 billion in a five day period earlier in August. So, is this time to panic? Or is this just a kind of a natural cycle we can all expect in a nascent industry? Who wants to start with that? Well, I think we've all been thinking about that this warning of winter is coming. All right, so to me, I think this is kind of more like ice age, which I think is great because, you know, to me, I'm very comfortable because my notion is that this is really washing out weekends. So, you know, ultimately, you know, even if you have mass extinction at the scale of 99.9% .9 of entities, you know, if you actually look at the ones that do come out of that, they're going to be colossal, right? They're going to be really, really good investments. So, you know, from the perspective of diversification, it just means that investors need to be smarter and more selective and more diversified. So, you know, those, those are just habits and good habits. Okay. You know, speaking of winter, the way I see it is like a Christmas sale in July. I mean, Ethereum 75% off, right? No, I, uh, I'm kidding. I'm not actually advising people to, uh, to stop on any of these points. Um, from my perspective, it's really more long-term potential. Uh, Near-term, uh, you know, drastic volatility. Uh, I think it's just uh, natural to such a nascent uh, industry that attracts global attention. But uh, what the technology represents and in very early stage project doing ICO pre-sale, that's what we focus on the Republic, myself personally as well. So I'm less about trading uh, on daily volatility and more on long-term potential. I think there's a little bit of a difference in this market versus certainly traditional venture capital because traditional venture capital is really about building companies, supporting entrepreneurs to build long-term value. And generally, you know, you the fastest way to between two points is straight line, but we know there's a lot of pivoting going on and figuring out the product in traditional early stage venture. I think the problem and the benefit of, of crypto and securitization is the same issue. It's the issue of uh, liquidity. So the fact that it's a good thing to unlock that liquidity <coughs> to a certain degree um, is also the negative because it allows people to slip out of the noose too early before things are ripe. And, and the added at risk is that there's this issue of speculation in the very, very short term. I mean, day traders compared to the patient money that needs to back entrepreneurs. So I think, again, it has some use cases. I think generally it's not appropriate. I think in certain cases it will be appropriate and it'll probably get better and better over time as compliance and all the things you guys are mentioning uh, get added. But I think the first volatility is not necessarily good. I don't think it's good. It's not what most entrepreneurs want. It's not what most investors want. It is what gamblers want. Gamblers are looking, speculators are looking for that. And you know, in places like Korea, where gambling in casinos is not allowed, this has allowed people to play those markets. It's also great for places with really unstable currencies, because they're trying to protect themselves against those currencies. So we're, we're, we're I'm not doing the panel is, but this, this whole topic mis mixes up quite a few different topics in finance. So it's complicated to separate the strands, and I'm talking too much, but I just want to throw that out. I think there's some good points about it, some very negative points about it. It's not traditionally what most early stage entrepreneurs have been looking for. Pierre or Ben, do you want to comment on that? You know, I, the volatility thing is fascinating. Yeah, I, mean, I mentioned earlier that I, my own belief system is that we're in a speculator's market, not an investor's market. Speculating is a valid form of investment. It is not the investment in my LPs 
provide new capital to participate in. Uh, people that speculate on currency futures or gold futures or oil futures, I mean, that is a job. And I assume that LPs put money into those boats to do exactly that. Um, but sort of to David's point, investing is, one, it's a long-term game. And two, it should come with a lot more than capital. You know, I had the thing about the volatility that scares me, it's very different for the entrepreneur, the person that raises money, than the person that quote unquote speculates or invests in the coin. Although I would argue a little bit that many of these coins would be akin to investing in penny stocks during the day when they were printed on pink sheets of paper and distributed to brokerage firms once a day. It's not unlikely that it will trade by appointment and the spreads will be so gargantuan that you can just, if you could be a market maker, wow, you make a stunning amount of money. Um, but I remember one of the things that made me really scared about whenever Bitcoin was just an inch shy of $20,000. One of my son, my son's 21, he's in college, one of my son's friends came to me and said, think about putting grandma into Bitcoin. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that just doesn't sound like a great idea. He's like, no, don't worry, I'll watch it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, it, it's a highly speculative thing, and I don't know if grandma needs this money to get by, but you, know, you want to make sure if grandma's on a fixed income, that fixed income continues. And we were at 198. <laughs> and two weeks later, you know, we're at 8,500. So, you know, I hope grandma's not in Bitcoin. And I think that it's, you know, look, if you sell, if you go out, I'll, I'll admit that if it was possible for me with high certainty, you know, that I could sell $50 million worth of some random thing, which I never have to do a thing to support ever again, and it can go to zero and I can't get in trouble, man, would that be tempting. I hope I'd be a big enough person not to do it because I think it's somewhat evil. But, you know, there's the person that got the capital, it's not equity in their business. It is arguably a, you know, a security or a mechanism for affecting certain things. But the only sort of virtual token that I've ever seen that I thought made sense was in a science fiction book. Uh, the guy that wrote The Martian has a second book out, and his virtual token is enough to take one gram of matter to Mars. His story is about people that live on Mars. That made a lot of sense. It's entirely tradable. Anyway, total. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You just wrote my next headline for me. Don't put grandma in Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> Send so, grandma so, to Mars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so Mark, I want to take a slightly different tack because I want to unpack what you said a little differently. Um, the activity we're seeing today is this notion of uh, people building things on this idea of utility tokens with a definition around what they feel a utility token is. Um, granted that the legal system is trying to identify what's happening today as securities, but having said that, if it were securities, they would behave differently. And so um, I guess when I look at the activity of utility tokens, um, that is a, as we've all discussed here, highly speculative, yes, all of the things we're talking about. But when we're looking at it as securities, uh, at that point we move into more traditional worlds. And so now we start to look at a more stable currency, um, and not a currency, as a matter of, a, a more stable asset class. Um, that um, where the movement, there may be a ton of speculation, but if we look at it as a fundraising vehicle for an entrepreneur, once they have the money, they can go build what they need to build. The fact that that token is going to be moving and doing things inside, um, I don't envision security tokens as something you will use to pay for the machine. And so this is the one thing that we need to understand about the separation of utility and security, if they're even going to be differentiated, is what can you do with the security? Because today I can't take a piece of stock and start to use it to pay for things that I'm using on, on a, in a machine. So I, I think we'll see a very different set of behaviors. Um, the stuff that's happening now, well, you know, again, it's not backed by anything. There's nothing at stake. So I think it's a very different behavior. I think it's worth clarifying and get everyone on the same page when we use the term security token. Uh, I was about to say that it's meaningless, but go ahead. I'm um, <laughs> so, um, you'll define it and you'll say it's completely ridiculous. Uh, there are a few types, but you know, mainly two. Uh, I would say that in our conversation with uh, the SEC and regulators and on the Republic team of six securities attorneys uh, and the legal academics uh, here in the room as well, it's pretty much generally accepted that there is no such thing as a new token that is not a security token unless 
it is completely stable, stable coin, or that you can use it for consumptive purposes, that is, you use it and burn it. If a token, doesn't matter what utility it may have, from the file coin to block stack to whatever else, if it fluctuates or will fluctuate, people buy it, hedging on the upward fluctuation, it is considered secure. Not necessarily. Bitcoin, <laughs> Ethereum. Yeah, no, but the, uh, I meant new. That's why I'm saying new tokens, new projects. Uh, okay. And then these projects- Until, until they like, become sufficiently decentralized. Correct. <laughs> and then within the new phase, in the first offering, so that's one. I think the security token context that perhaps you may have in mind, an uh, asset-backed token, which has an element similar to stock and bonds and shares that you receive financial back in addition to that volatility, which will remain forever securities as, as long as as far as we know. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to retort and say that was really good. Uh, you know, for me, I'm objecting to the idea of security token because I've never had a particularly good conversation including that phrase. But I think you, you handled it really well. It just when you get to the phrase asset back token that happens to be regulated as a security, now we can have a conversation and it's beautiful, right? The reason why I'm objecting to it is the only lens that matters is the regulator. Right? And so the point being that, you know, if you say if you say that there's a thing called a utility token that's not a security, you're just dumb and you're gonna go to jail. So like, you know, you should just not even think that this conversation intrinsically has a meaning, right? In the sense of if you think there is a thing called a utility token that's not a security, nine falls out of 10, you're gonna go to jail, right? So the point being, I think you, you said it beautifully well. I thought you were gonna go down a different hole, but you did, I think, I think and yeah, you. And there's, there's a challenge in the industry in that the vast majority of offshore projects do not understand that, have offered until very recently, freely in the US, and there are plenty of people who are still doing it now, and yet the SEC is not enforcing. So uh, those who are trying to be compliant just behind the curve and have to undertake a huge expense, or will the SEC go after 99% of all of the unlawful projects? I mean, that really remains to be seen. All right, well, we'll, we'll dive into the regulatory side, but I also want to get to kind of the security versus venture capital uh, you know, topic, because that's obviously what we're here for. So, you know, we know, and I mean, it's been written by my colleagues, this is the age of the security token, it's the dawn of the new era, but at the same time, it, be, it appears to be a legitimate funding mechanism disrupting venture capital. What's your take on that? How, how is this playing out as you see it right now in the venture capital community? Well, the, I guess it also uh, bears to defy venture capital. I do think that uh, token fundraising by your uh, token sales is indeed venture capital, that venture capital which is financing early stage projects. But if you're talking about venture capital firms, then it's the pros and cons. The con is that I think almost new projects now are trying new companies, any you know, tech heavy team of any startup uh, are trying to find a way to incorporate blockchain into their business model uh, and fundraise from, from the ICO avenue. Uh, and that necessarily leave less talent and I think that a lot of VCs are constrained by their LP agreement and they cannot deploy capital into token sales. On the other hand, we start to see the tokenization of VCs, which brings in, which would makes it easier for them to fundraise. So I think it's on both sides of the coin. I think the LP agreements are a little overblown because you know I was talking with a general partner at a tier one VC and his perspective I was like hey so how are you structuring tokenized investment in your out of your regular fund how do you justify it because we were talking about doing a deal together and and he said I said did you renegotiate your LP agreement he's like no we'll just do it. So, you know, and the LPs will deal with it, right? So, are they going to sue us? I'm going to have a comment on that. Saying in one breath, tier one firm, and in another breath, we'll just do it and the LPs will deal with it. I don't know. tier one firm. Okay, well. I can say that I won't say the name because I don't want it. My judgment of that firm would be different. I don't have a a way of expressing I can express. <laughs> but having said that, I, I spent just a modest amount of time on this topic, I actually talked to, the, when all of, so as ICOs started to occur, and let's face it, there's sort of one of the things I learned a long time ago, I had a, 
a fintech entrepreneur, the one that introduced me to Bitcoin six, seven years ago, and his business was going quite well, but it was at a relatively steady pace. And I said, well, you know, why aren't you going faster? He said, Ben, this isn't like a regular business that you're invested in. If I go faster and I'm wrong, I go to jail. This is not break things and fix them. This is jail time. And so I guess I would say that if there's a risk of jail time and you're comfortable with that and you're offering, then that's something you're entirely entitled to consider. Um, we did, however, at the beginning of all this, start to talk. This I was at a different fund, and we bought in council. And the way they express is that most venture firms, LPAs, I'm not referring to any specific one, say that, because actually this goes back way before Bitcoin or at least blockchain-related transactions, to the advent of convertible node. Convertible notes are not equity. And rural notes are not even really debt anymore because they've manipulated them so much that they're this hybrid Frankenstein creature that I don't think would ever survive a court battle to be expressed as debt. But in order to be able to invest in those, as of, call it, eight, ten years ago with all the different incubators are coming out, the phrase that was added to most LP agreements was equity or equity-like instruments. And lawyers will opine on whether a ICO or a token is an equity-like instrument. And I've heard them opine in both directions. I've heard a single lawyer opine in both directions. <laughs> he said, you can look at it either way. But I'll tell you this, when, when my entrepreneurs come to me and ask me about something they're trying to decide about, and there's any risk at all of something really horrific happening, my answer is, if it's a possibility that something bad happens, like somebody dies, or you go to jail, or you incur the wrath of the US government, or have massive financial fines, I'd say, let's not take that risk. The US government has a ridiculously long memory. And while they're not, there are a certain number of things that transacted which the SEC opined as being okay and they would not pursue. If you're not one of those, whether it's two years from now or 20, I don't want to be one waiting around for the day that somebody new takes over and decides it would be great to go retrieve that $500 million of money that was put into this asset class that they no longer feel positively about. So let's do a little bit of history. First, we distinguish between utility tokens and security tokens. And in your view, the new ones are somewhat similar. The old utility is problematic for tax purposes, one, very problematic, and for the, all the issues that have been raised. But let's go then, we've been also conflating two other topics, which is the company raising the money and the venture fund structuring itself as a securitized fund, okay, like blockchain and spice and so on. So what is old is new again. So in the history, I'm old enough to remember this, there was a famous company mainly in the UK called Triple I. It was a big VC fund back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. There were a few others, but there were not many. Very, very few venture capital funds chose to go public and trade on the markets. Can anybody understand why? Partly it was public disclosure that they had to do and for, because of company line companies. And second, it was that they almost always traded at a discount to the NAV. So why would you want to do that? So you expose yourself and you're trading at a discount. So I think they, Triple I, I think went out of business and I think they've come back in, right? I, I don't know in their, Maybe Ben would know. Do you know the form that they've come in? I don't know they came back. Okay, maybe not. There are a couple <laughs> they, definitely, they definitely went out. And maybe there's some others that are publicly listed. But most VCs, worth their salt, do not choose to go um, public for a variety of reasons. So I think that's, in, that's um, demonstrative of certain important traits for us. One is, again, letting our, fees, our, our entrepreneurs have time. Patient, out of light. Remember there was just a controversy in the press that I think the president of the CEO of Coke talked to President Trump. She said, oh, we shouldn't do quarterly reporting. How about semi-annual? And he said, oh, maybe that's interesting. We'll look at that. And the markets are you know, saying, hey, that's a good idea, not important, whatever. But th the point is that there is some degree of value that we find for entrepreneurs in not being the bright glare of corporately quarterly reporting uh, for some period of time. So that's one. And then there's a whole bunch of other issues that it's just not defined. Again, I think, Ben, you're right. Most of the LP agreements for funds right now um, don't really countenance it. And so we, for example, were not, we did not want to choose to invest in any, certainly, um, ICO that were not securities, that were just um, utility tokens. We couldn't do that. Um, some of our companies have thought about issuing, and that's sort of neither here nor there, because if we just own this thing and they do it, they, they chose not to because they, the market has been you know, quite lots of chaotic. So I think there are a lot of uh, boulders in the path so far. This is not at all clear cut. We are I'm pretty sure in our next fund, we will probably avail ourselves of the opportunity to invest 
<coughs> security token uh, kinds of um, investments in the future. So I think we're going to, most VCs, I'm assuming, will want the flexibility, but I'm not sure how we'll uh, actively pursue it. It's interesting, the most active discussion I saw inside of multiple firms was how to think about ICOs as relating to dilution and pro rata rights. Exactly. Right? Because you can invest in a company, and then that company can go on to do an ICO. Well, that ICO is not equity in the company. But at the same time, it's providing capital, and now the entrepreneur doesn't need capital anymore. And you know, let's use an extreme example. I'm just making this up. Although it is interesting that for two years, every entrepreneur that ever approached me that said they had an ICO opportunity said, by the way, 85% of these are a scam. But mine's not. <laughs> and yet I saw 200 entrepreneurs. So I'm trying to figure out, oh, that's interesting. So there must be thousands of entrepreneurs out there scamming us that I haven't met yet. Um, but if you, if you find that company, and they go out and they raise all that capital, and they no longer need capital, then sort of that can change the behavior of the company and the entrepreneur and everything else. And so there was a lot of discussion about do funds need to reserve the right to a pro rata portion of, and I'm talking about traditional firms, because there are firms that have been, A, formed purely to invest in blockchain and um, ICO related products. There are also, I was approached when I was in between firms by an entrepreneur that I like a lot who wanted to create a, a venture fund purely backed through an ICO because his view is, well, David's point on uh, public scrutiny is very, very accurate. Uh, so the one thing that venture funds do not have is regular liquidity, right? You know, it's a 10 to 12 year lifespan. So you put a dollar into a venture firm, it's not like three years later, you know, they have Uber and they sell it and they give you money. It's, it's gonna take quite a while to get to liquidity. And so one of the ideas that's been floating around, I think there's one, maybe two firms that have done this, is, you know, if we raise our funds through an ICO, then those units can trade. But they do have all kinds of, of issues around it. So I think that a lot of firms have tried to figure out different things. Do they want to play at all in the ICOs themselves? Do they want to play in the companies that will go on to fund through ICO? Is that ICO a plus or a minus? How will it impact the firm and its ownership? And does that need to be baked in? And then ultimately we have to figure that out, not just in future uh, LPAs, but in term sheets. You know, I, don't, I haven't seen those yet, but I know that some firms have really thought about this a lot and want to have the right to a pro rata share of the token sale. If I own 25% of your company, I'm not saying that we do this, I'm just saying you know, one <coughs> entrepreneur could come to a firm and they could say, if we're going to put in this money and have 25% ownership, we want to have the right to buy 25% of that ICO because we don't yet understand how it's going to impact the company over time. All right, so what I'm kind of hearing a little bit in, in response to this is, uh, David, you kind of talked about, well, if you can't beat them, join them. It sounds a little bit like that. Or we're going to think about, you know, what our right strategy is and then move when the time is right and it's all timing and all that. I guess the, the, what's interesting about this is in preparation for this panel, there were a number of stories I saw on the internet that basically said venture capital is going to be disrupted. You know, get ready for it. So what should the venture's res community's response be, I mean, in your view? If, if, if we believe that that's certainly a possibility, how should they respond? Well, sorry, before I go there, I mean, my concern is, is a narrow viewing of what the venture capital, what venture capital is bring to the table. <laughs> Um, a differentiation in how this money uh, comes in and gets deployed. A lot of it has to do with deal flow. In other words, these are all different avenues by which money can come in, and whether it's a, uh, a crowdfunding platform or a VC, um, what they bring to the table is their ability, first of all, to see deals. And so the notion that a lot of individuals are now going to get a chance to invest and see deals is the first question. Um, the money side of it, I think, is very secondary. So I see a lot, I mean, most of the ICOs I see today, and again, um, this notion of security is still troublesome for me right now, just understanding the separation, but most of the action, you know, the, it's still accredited investors. It's still all of the things we see in seed, uh, professional seed investors and VCs coming in. So I think the money to me is very secondary, and I would look at the value that venture capital is bringing in other ways that basically is hard to disrupt. Yeah. I want to just use a quick example of this because I have, I have no negative feelings about ICOs. If, a, if anybody here can go scrape up $50 million through a bunch of people who want to give it to you in you know, total freedom, more power to you. <laughs> I'm not giving you $50 million with those terms. Um, I have an entrepreneur who just, it hasn't been announced yet, so I won't be that specific, but uh, he just became a unicorn and probably the most, one of the most exciting businesses. It is the most exciting business I've ever been involved in. And we had breakfast the other day and he said, I want to thank you so much for helping me pick not just the right firm, but the right partner. 
He said, I didn't understand it at the time when you said you should take XYZ's money. I was a seed investor, I was trying to help him raise, we had lots of opportunity, all the most famous firms in the world, and I very strongly endorsed this one person. And he said, I thought you were doing it because it would look good in the press. It would be good to have this person who happens to run the fund in question. And he said, and now I realize how much it has mattered. Uh, we've done three rounds, that firm did two, maybe three of them, um, and then introduced him to the company that made him into a unicorn, and the terms were all clean and easy and beautiful, and just, I mean, this guy's running a phenomenal business, and what he has not had to spend a lot of time on is all the pain in the butt realities. It's not that he hasn't had to do the work to raise the money. Nobody gave him a gift of capital. But the quality of the people that have been involved have allowed him to do things that he would probably not have been able to have done with the speed and efficacy that he did. And he considers that to be world-changingly awesome. And when you raise money, I mean, I'm a fan of AngelList. But when entrepreneurs ask me if they should go on AngelList, I say, who's your lead? Because all my, I have two entrepreneurs of my own that are now very, very effective AngelList syndicators. And I feel there's some similarity here. And they both tell me the same thing. They've got a syndicate of all these folks. They've got SPVs they can spin up. And everybody looks at the big write-up, and they go down to who's the lead investor. Oh, I've heard of them. Great, I'm in. You know, the, the anchoring. What does a lead investor do? Like, what's a lead investor's responsibility? Think about that for a second. It's not just that they write the biggest check. They normally do. They negotiate the terms. They do the diligence. They do the work. They do the work for everybody else to say yes. This is a real business. I'm not saying that VCs have not ever had the wool pulled over their eyes. I've certainly seen examples of that. But it's an enormous amount of work to lead around. And if you do it right, I mean, it involves quite a bit. And in, you could argue that other investors should be more confident because of that work that was done. And I think that's a valuable thing. And it's probably something you wouldn't see in more of a free form crowdfunding style model, whether that's ICO based or angelist based. Since I'm the only one in the panel who is uh, currently an entrepreneur fundraising for a startup that happens to be also an investment fund, an investment platform, um, my view as someone fundraising uh, is that the role of venture capitalists and venture funds cannot be displaced in that just like Ben said, with capital comes what is even more valuable, the network, the advice for, for years to come. That does not mean that crowdfunding, which is what we do for retail investors, $10 at a time to invest in Republic.co even with your credit card, and take it to the extreme level, which is token sale around the world, people participating. That source of capital also bring the community, people who evangelize for you, and certainly easy money. So the two can very much go hand in hand and not by any means mutually exclusive. And I think that's why you see whether with Republic or with any of these major token projects out there, they do raise from the Union Square Venture, the NEA, or Highland Capital, Andreessen, and all of the noted VCs as an indication of validation and as you know, and for advice, and then go out to the market to fundraise from people who just follow and don't have time to do due diligence. So I don't think it's disrupting venture capital as much as you know, enhancing the ecosystem for all participants all around. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, David, you got a, 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 a story, a story from history is kind of a fun one. There's a famous story of a VC here in the Valley who early on wanted to invest in um, a young company that was in the software business, and the entrepreneur didn't want to meet him. And so the, the VC phoned the secretary of this entrepreneur, found out when he was heading back to the, visiting the Silicon Valley, flying back to the city, bought a ticket, finagled his way with the desk help to get the seat next to this entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is sitting there going like, why are you hassling me like this? I, I want to invest in your company. I know you want to invest in my company, but I don't need the money. I'm already cash flow positive. I don't need it. I know you don't need my money. You need me. You need my time, my help, my advice. That, that was Dave Marquardt and the company, and the entrepreneur was Bill Gates and the company was Microsoft. And he took his money, Bill Gates took the money, didn't need it, took it. The guy stayed on his board for decades, I think, and it was a super productive relationship. So there is definitely value beyond the money. 
All right, um, I, before we get to questions, I don't want to lose sight of the regulatory question because that has been uh, one that's uh, dominating the news for quite a while. I, I happened to be in New York uh, earlier this month and covered the FinTech Week conference there, and I was a little surprised because uh, the feeling, at least at that event, was very positive. The Treasury Department had just indicated they were going to uh, be very receptive to FinTech companies. The OCC had floated the idea of a national charter uh, for companies. The SEC is apparently willing to listen and try to get it right, according to some of the people in the room. What's your take on this right now? Where, where does the regulatory picture stand in your view, and do you think that could be a problem down the line? So uh, it's the lack of clarity that I think is a major problem for entrepreneurs. Before going to tech, I was a securities litigator, Gwen Proctor, um, and was general counsel for AngelList. I have been very involved in trying to navigate and understand the changing regulatory framework as applied to crypto. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, before crypto, people have been selling stock to accredited and not accredited on Republic. There's a way, a compliant way to do all of these things. It obviously comes with cost, with time, and if you're willing to be compliant and mitigate the risk by going through all the you know the hoops to uh, to get to your goal, that may be retail distribution or accredited investors only. There's absolutely a way to do it, but um, to wait for an exemption for crypto as an asset class and free of all securities litigate uh, securities implication, I think is a dream that will never come true. Yeah, and, and there should be some concern in the sense that there is a lot of tokens out there today. Um, so before we see what's going to happen with the new tokens, uh, we, we are still waiting for those rules to, well, if you talk to somebody at the SEC or, or attorneys that are dealing with the SEC right now, um, there's clarity in the sense that the rules are there. And so, as you've put it, you know, everything's a security, so now you have to operate back and say, okay, well, all of those people who are out there, what's gonna happen? What are the remedies? Um, if, if the remedy is that they have to return the funds, how does that happen? Will it happen in crypto? Will it happen in dollar value? Who will get that? The people who own the tokens today or who own them at the time it was sold? So there's a whole lot of stuff that's undefined. So I think we're gonna have a little bit more chaos and mess um, and we've yet to see, the SEC's gone after low-hanging fruit, uh, at least the clear fraudsters as the first line. Um, yeah. We haven't seen them go after projects that I would say behave as properly as they felt they could without being outright fraudsters. So we haven't seen any case being brought against those folks yet, and we really need, do need to see some of those to get some sense of what's going on. They also have a very Tax. business-friendly administration, and I won't comment on my views of the administration, I'll just say that this administration is trying to unwind everything the last administration did. There's no reason to believe that the same thing couldn't happen again. I said earlier that the US government has a very long memory. Very quick story has nothing to do with technology. Uh, David and I have the most stories because we have the most age. Um, my grandfather was an entrepreneur his whole life. And he used to be a solar entrepreneur, and then they changed the tax code, and that business disappeared, so he became a chemicals entrepreneur. He bought a warehouse and a factory that manufactured chemicals. And the EPA came to him one day and said, we have records that 20 years before you bought this facility, a single barrel of toxic waste was buried in the back facility, and we need you to prove that you have mitigated or it was mitigated before you owned it, or you have to pay us a fine. And my grandfather fought that until the day he died. Because what he discovered was there is no, what's the thing in a rule of law where if you did something bad but it's long enough later? Statue of limitations. Yeah. There is no statute of limitations in the US government. They can chase you forever. All they need is somebody new running the administration, and I'm not talking about the president necessarily, but it could be the SEC, that has a view that's different than the past. And as far as I can tell, I don't know this for certain, a lawyer could answer this, I don't know that they have to care how long ago it was. And I'm just, I'm, my view is simple, like death, taxes, and anything to do with the government, I never want to have to mess with any of them. <laughs> I think though that uh, one of the important points to emphasize is, is that part of the construct of censorship resistance is not predicated solely on anonymity, but it's actually predicated on this concept of an internet money that has routing capabilities, right? So because of the routing capabilities, by the way, I'm saying that this isn't predicated on anonymity because I believe that global AML is coming. So I feel like KYC and AML will be non-negotiable planet-wide. So I think that's coming. But there is censorship resistance with respect to things like domicile competition. 
So in a sense, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing capital routing around the United States. I'm seeing U.S. investors investing out of Cayman theaters. I'm basically seeing basically the whole dance. Same thing with China, which is, do you think that the Chinese ban on crypto has stopped Chinese crypto? It's stronger than ever. Chinese crypto is ragingly strong. <clears throat> And the ban has done nothing. So, you know, essentially routing has taken care of the problem because it's the internet. Okay, so that is one difference. If it was at one, what's been previous and, and today, the, the big difference is that fractional ownership has existed in certain things, like the Green Bay Packers was an, exhibit, an example. Um, but fractional ownership, you know, that was only one team that I know of that was like that. Most teams are, you know, much more consolidated by one family or one group, or small group. So fractional ownership isn't positive. The globalization aspect, really, and, and the arbitrage of jurisdictions uh, is very important here. And again, that's why we invested in a few Bitcoin-related companies that were using Bitcoin hopefully for remittance and payments and so on in the US in the last few years ago. They didn't work out because our country is too strong, too stable, and it wasn't a pain point enough. In places like Venezuela or Malta, or I don't know, different places, like, no aspersions on Malta, um, across Cyprus, I think, you know, where the government came in yeah, and you know, appropriated. Malta's in the EU, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cyprus, in Cyprus, actually, the, I think the bank at one point, the government came in and like expropriated bank accounts one day. And, and in Venezuela, we know what's happening. So those places, some of these kinds of um, currencies make a lot more sense. And we've seen a lot more use there. So this whole regulatory arbitrage and, and the uncertainty is very uh, problematic. I usually Ben and I spar, and I tend to be, I thought I was more on the libertarian side of less regulation, you were a little bit for more. This is a place where I think we do need more, and we certainly need what you said, certainty, because it's too fuzzy, it's too quixotic right now, and that's not good. It may be good for speculators and people doing you know, monkey business, but for those of us who want to be serious investors, certainty is good, and, and, and a bit of more transparency, so that we understand the rules and everyone's playing sort of by the fair level playing field. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Those are a few, a few points on it. Just in fairness, I'm a huge fan of the idea of having, I'm probably going to end up with stablecoin, with something that will allow cross-border, instantaneous, no-fee transactions, which is not a description of most of the coins that are out there right now. The tax is quite heavy to do a transaction. It has been tried over and over again. Now it's working. Now, if you go back to 1993 and the launch of the web, um, there was CyberCash, there was CyberCoin. I love these things. I don't know what happened to them. They either died or got bought. Uh, I, when Lehman failed, I wanted to start a digital currency backed by gold, and if only there had been a blockchain protocol at the time, I could have actually done that. Wouldn't that be cool for me to sit up here and tell you about my you know, $48 billion of the gold I'd amassed somewhere and you can trade it in dollar chunks? Um, so I think that the possibilities that are empowered by, I think companies back using blockchain are, can do some amazing things. Um, I, I don't believe they have to, need to, must do an ICO. It's more, you know, like I'm fascinated by the technology and what it empowers. I'm wondering if there's room for more than the few coins that already seem to be working pretty well. Um, and so I'm not negative at all in this, but the topic of sort of how it displaces and how entrepreneurs make decisions you know, is, is a very different one than the underlying products that can be empowered. The decision you make for how to fundraise is one that only you can make. It's going to be made on a whole lot of different criteria, including return horizons and return beliefs. You know, if, if this serves your needs, that's great. I'm not negative on that at all. Then I do think, generally, government should stay out of our business and we'll do better because of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Another area that I would also touch on is that um, I think that what's going to happen with security tokens, as in asset-backed tokens, um, is, is really going to dwarf everything we've seen. Because this notion that um, you can all of a sudden start to, in, speaking of democratization, for example, REITs, there are minimums there because it's such a hassle to do the paperwork necessary to distribute to REIT holders. So imagine now that you are the $10 investor that wants to come to Republic, and now Republic offers a REIT, or access to a REIT. That's huge. And, and so we are opening it up to other nations, other worlds, uh, where people just don't have the means today to access that kind of, those kinds of assets. Yeah, so you're really talking about kind of unit account, unit of account, yeah. the kind of minimum viable uh, liquidity component. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take the mic here, and um, I'm going to come out in the audience because this is your opportunity now to ask a question of the panel. We've got a good discussion so far, and I've got to play moderator here on the, in the field with the mic because we're live streaming and taping this. So who wants to go first? You do? Okay, go ahead. 
so thank you very much. So I'm very much convinced about the importance of the venture capital fund. But uh, what do you think uh, about the uh, role of the LP investors into the venture capital funds? Because like, you know, no, everyone talks about tokenization of the venture capital. So how about the tokenization of the LP investors and what are their roles are for you? I think I was trying to mention that when I was mentioning there's fundraising at the company level and then the, for the venture capital fund. So let's take the right head on the issue of LPs. Why do LPs want? They want long-term returns that are higher than the stock market. That's because we take more risk and so we should get more reward. So the, the big issue that they don't like is being locked up for say 10 years in a typical traditional venture fund. So there are some other ways that are starting to make themselves available that are alternatives. I, I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm, I'm in favor, we're all I think, positive about this industry in general. It's early, early innings, maybe it's even pre-game right now. Um, so there's a lot more to fix, but let me just give you a couple examples of where, how you can get liquidity these days. Um, the secondary market has opened up dramatically. That's because IPOs got pushed through too much regulation to later, and people were delaying. So that meant that a lot of people were cash poor and stock rich, so they needed money to buy a house. So we started, VC started becoming more flexible on allowing secondaries. Also, um, it works the other way. Even funds now can sell. We've sold on um, Nutanix before its IPO, and on Hootsuite we sold to like Wellington and Fidelity and some of these big groups who are the traditional IPO buyers. And they were, were saying, wait a minute, we don't have IPOs anymore, we've got to get that growth earlier. We want to take some risk off the table with high profit, and we were able to, to neutralize like that. So there, there are these new um, water finding level methods for entrepreneurs and funds to access the markets. It's not nearly as liquid as what it will be with uh, securitization, but it's not complete black and white as it was in the past. Yeah, I mean, to me, the thing that's really intriguing would be contemplating the reaction of a general partnership to a tokenized LP, right? So I think, I, you know, I don't have visibility into that. I think funds actually have a pretty high variability with respect to partner disposition. So I, I think you'll see a lot of different firms looking at that very differently. But you know, I think as a as a fund myself and a GP, like sounds great. Like, we'd love to have a tokenized LP. Um, a couple of funds that I had a chance to chat with actually were exploring this very seriously because um, uh, for those that allow it, and so you know, if an LP wants to exit their fund, uh, the fund they're in, um, it's it's quite a lot of paperwork, and and it's it's not just paperwork. It's it's negotiations. It's time consuming. Um, the fund has to agree that the LP can get out. The LP has to find a counterparty. Uh, so there's a lot of um, friction in that process, and probably for good reason. Discount and discount. Or, That's or right. Well, well, no, there, 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 is, there is a liquidity discount, right? So so or an illiquidity discount. Right? So these are things that are that are really difficult to deal with. Um, so uh, in a tokenized model. A lot of that can be built into the token, and so the movement can be a little bit more flexible. So where some funds are beginning to consider this, I'm seeing more not into the existing fund, but if they're raising a new fund, it's becoming a real option uh, to consider. Well, it seems like the happening more in new funds entirely. There was one fund, I can't remember the name of it, that did an ICO to fund itself as a venture firm. Um, there's actually a fund that was based on Bitcoin that invested in one of my portfolio companies they've never had to raise again because they raised from them about five years ago. All of the investment was made in Bitcoin. As Bitcoin has increased in value, their bank balance has increased. And they just feed That's actually that. most of the ICOs from a year ago. No, this is going way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, questions. Let's see. Let's back here. Hi, thank you very much for the insights, but I have a question. To take a step farther, do you think that the blockchain technology or tokenization will be able to disrupt the, um, the book entry system that the US stock market, bond market use with DTC at the moment? This is probably my favorite place to think about how blockchain can do things. This is why I'm not so focused on the, the layer on top, but uh, the fact that you can have an internal decentralized record of an asset and a transaction just seems incredibly powerful. You know, title is a great example of this. I think the title is a ridiculously antiquated ripoff. I mean, you know, everybody that buy, I bought a house, I'm the fifth owner of it, it's almost 100 years old, and I'm paying title insurance to somebody to tell me that, yeah, I can own it the way I think I can own it. I mean, five people in 100 years have owned this house. Last guy was there for 27 years. 
a little odd. So, but I think all <laughs> kinds of assets that can be secured by that. I, when I took my company public, the fees you pay to American stock transfer are not de minimis at all. You know, even as an investor, when I see my early seed companies either go public or have liquidity events and they're funneled through that. So, you know, you can, as long as it's reliable. Now, having said all that, you could also do it through an Oracle database. And the, the thing that I always want to understand is why is it that much better that it's distributed? Because you are going to create a tax in time and some sort of transaction reality and lag. Um, and so why is it better than a controlled set of data? And is it absolutely trusted? There's been some conversations. I don't have enough knowledge to, to speak to them. But um, there's been some argument that there's, this is not a ridiculously difficult thing to hack. And so if you have a distributed ledger that is arguably in some way hackable at the root, then all of a sudden you lose confidence, and then all those transactions are no longer going to be reliable. I don't have the ability to speak to that. Maybe that was I, you know, from the perspective of provenance, I think that's absolutely a key use case. But I think the other use case that makes a ton of sense is actually exchange and trade settlement, right? So, you know, if you look at traditional asset transfers, the settlement process is actually it takes weeks, right? So it's really an astonishingly bureaucratic process. It is expensive, and it actually reduces the. Uh, Kind of ability in the liquidity market. So, yeah, I, I do think that there are actually now uh, exchanges that are truly focused on uh, traditional financial instruments that are dealing with settlement. I actually know of one that's Malta based that's going to be trading only pure European financial instruments that are equities, that are the things we're used to buying and selling, but all the settlement and custody will be handled using cryptographic assets. You know, either on behalf of clients or directly to the clients who are capable of holding those assets. So it's a very, very interesting model. Um, sorry, let me let me also point you to Axon, uh, A X O N I. Uh, it's uh, they recently uh, closed a significant round from J P Morgan, and uh, I believe Goldman Sachs is also in there. Um, Axoni is New York based. Um, they are working directly with the DTCC, uh, and they're ex ex trying to deal with exactly this issue. It is the blockchaining effectively of the DC, DTCC function, uh, where the DTCC will play a different role than they currently play today. Uh, so they will not be the, necessarily the data owner, but the platform. Uh, Just to expand the point about um, corporate investment in this area and corporate interest in blockchain, I think it was in 2015, of the top 10 funded venture companies uh, dealing with blockchain, none of them had corporate investors. By 2016, I think all top 10 had corporate investors. So we're seeing a real rush of the corporate world into that. I think that's a good sign um, because they will have the biggest use and uh, for it in the in the enterprise world. Remember, I said we failed with a couple of companies that were Bitcoin to consumer related back in the day, and it's been much much more successful in use you know in other countries. But in the U.S. in the big boys market of enterprise, Goldman Sachs and, and uh, J.P. Morgan just mentioned that's a good sign because they can help trade its counterparties with it. So if they're willing to adopt it as a standard, that'll be a positive sign. Uh, but sorry, I think that the one point to understand on, on what's happening in the corporate world, um, the realization for a lot of them is that it's not necessarily the nature of a blockchain per se. So in blockchains, we're, we're accustomed to taking transactions, putting them in blocks, linking the blocks. Um, the stuff that we're seeing out of um, uh, R3, for example, with Corda, uh, what's happening with Hyperledger, uh, these are more about transactionally based, linking transactions. So it's more about what you were saying, which is the settlement side, which is cumbersome and frictionful. Um, and, and really exchanging that for a model that says, hey, we really need to address this, this friction issue. It's not so much that decentralized, all of these buzzwords that we use in the public blockchain world are not what's interesting to the folks on the inside. Okay, other questions here. I'm going to get to this side. I've gotten to this side of the room, all the way in the back. You've been waiting all night for this. There you go. Thank you. Um, in terms of interoperability, I think that you know, if you looked into your crystal ball, uh, the ability to, let's say, you know, fra fractionalized ownership, I could buy a portion of a Picasso and pay my rent with that, you know, quickly, sufficiently. You know, how, how far off do you see that? And you know, is that sort of the utopian situation? 
Um, my guess is that it's going to be 2019, given that in Republic we're working on, uh, on that. Uh, and so a uh, tokenization project would take a few months to map out the framework, laying on the technical uh, you know, infrastructure, identifying sources of money, and take it to market. So uh, I'll be disappointed at uh, myself if this time next year we would have already launched um, you know, a, number, a range of traditional assets. Um, and we've seen, I've seen, I just came back from Switzerland and out in Zug and, and uh, Zurich and saw companies proposing this for gold, uh, back, you know, tokens backed by gold. So, so, and then we've seen it for re starting in real estate. So, the, the, the people are addressing all the obvious um, assets for fractionalizing ownership. It, make, it makes sense. I was they fractionalized ownership and assets long before blockchain came around. I mean, you've had for sure. virtual markets and everything from poker players to art and you know there's been a lot of interesting things happening with home ownership where you can sell off a portion of your home to various But, I, but I, one yeah. counterpoint that just to point on, on, on gold, I, I'm not a gold person, but what they were saying is you could own you know shares in, in a gold index. Right, I'm sure it was called like AUR or something like that. Based on NASDAQ. So you're, you know you got gold stuff behind it, but you didn't know it was that gold. Whereas with the blockchain, you can actually get down to the bar uh, and you know where it is, and it's your specific. And with a painting, that's all the more so important. So the specificity of this is, is unique. It's fair, but there's one, these are marketplace realities. Somebody does have to, you could have all that functionality, but if no one chalks up a Van Gogh they're willing to sell, you're sort of out of luck on your Van Gogh token. Um, gold has already been fractionalized online through multiple players. I know this only because I wanted to do my digital gold currency when we built. Um, however, what the blockchain will probably help with is exactly that point. There's a lot of scammy, there wasn't a lot of belief. If you actually want to sort of dig into this really deeply, you can go read all these gold bugs that talk about how none of the ways you can trade gold is truly as reliable as you think it is. All that gold that's in the, if there's GLD, there's others. You know, gold is pretty simplistic in how it's managed for countries. There's Fort Knox is a thing. They have big bins of gold. When Switzerland needs to move $400 million to another country, they literally take a tag and move it from gold to gold. Um, so there's there's been a lot of attempts to do it. The, the thing that I always wonder about, and there may be people that can opine on this, is you've still got to show the attachment to that unit. You still have that marketplace dynamic underneath. And you know, one of the reasons that some of the things in gold have been back in the day when people were looking at ETFs around gold, one of the arguments was that over time it will collapse because there's not enough gold in the universe to feed the fear that was pushing people into gold during a time when we believed the banks would collapse. And you know, so how does it work when all this? Here's my guess, by the way. If it's 100 cents on the dollar in gold today, and demand goes up, then it goes to 90 cents on the dollar's gold, and the rest is speculative. Then it goes to 80 and 70 and 60, because whoever's running that currency isn't going to say, sorry, I'm out of currency. They're going to say, you know what, we're just going to back a little bit less of with gold right now. And the gold standard goes away. All right, we have reached the end of our time. Uh, please give this panel a warm round of applause.